origin story of Boom really goes back to uh, 2007 uh, when I was working at a tech startup in Seattle. And one day my then girlfriend was on one of these horribly delayed flights, like three or four hours late. And while I was waiting, I figured I, I got to look into what happened to supersonic aircraft. And, uh, that day I put a Google alert on supersonic jet because I wanted to be first to know when I could go break the sound barrier. But for nearly 10 years, it was crickets. No credible effort to build something I could see myself or my friends or family uh, actually flying on. And uh, so about four years ago, uh, after I left my last big company job, I figured I got to look at this supersonic thing and probably do a couple of weeks of research and get it out of my system. But what I discovered instead was pretty surprising. You know, it's been 50 years since Concorde was designed with slide rolls and drafting paper. It turns out if you take everything that's been developed for airplanes since then, so going from wind tunnels to computer simulation for development, going from aluminum to carbon fiber, going from uh, turbo jets with afterburners to turbo fans that are more quiet and efficient. And if you put all that together, you can generate a 75% improvement and the cost of flying supersonic. So a ticket on Concorde that would have cost $20,000 would cost more like $5,000 with a new generation airplane using uh, modern technology. And so once you realize that, you decide uh, either I have no courage or we're gonna start a company and go make this happen. There are really three areas where you have to make progress uh, compared to Concorde in order to make this work. Aerodynamics, materials or structural efficiency, and propulsion. So aerodynamics, it's about getting more lift for less drag and having an airplane that is super efficient at high speed and controllable and flyable at low speed for takeoff and landing. That, that's really the hardest aerodynamic challenge. Structural efficiency, so carbon fiber composites are a huge enabler for what we're doing, and that allows you to build a strong, lightweight structure that's a very complex shape. So, for example, if we look at the XV1 mock up and the hangar here, you'll see that there's virtually no straight line anywhere on the airplane. It's a very dynamic, fluid shape. The same thing will be true of the airliner, and building those shapes out of aluminum would basically be cost prohibitive. You'd have to have a military size budget for all the tool and die machines that you would need to create all those custom panels. But for a composite aircraft, you basically mold the entire vehicle, uh, and so you can create a complex shape uh, for essentially no added cost. And then last but not least is the engines. So Concorde famously was the only passenger airplane to ever fly in regular service with afterburners. And you know, if you're an airplane geek, afterburners are just the coolest thing. Yeah. Uh, there's a flame coming out the back of the engine. They're rip roaring loud. You can't miss them when they go by. Uh, but uh, if you're an airline or a passenger, you don't love them because they're loud enough that they bother people on the ground. Uh, they're incredibly fuel inefficient, uh, and they're. Um, uh, and like we said, they're noisy. So uh, fast forward today, there's new engine technology that lets you get all the thrust you need for high-speed flight without an afterburner, which means you're quieter and more efficient. Right. Uh, I think it's easier to imagine uh, why to do the, the prototype uh, by thinking about what it would be like if we didn't. Yeah. So as a new company, we're going to build a 170,000 pound Mach 2.2 safety critical passenger airplane as the very first thing we do. Uh, we'd be highly likely not to get it right the first time. Uh, we'd be highly likely to not convince investors, suppliers, customers uh, to throw in with us. And so the uh, XB1 is about uh, you know, demonstrating that we have the team and the technology to go off and make a practical supersonic airliner. Uh, Behind me here 
is the uh, the mock-up of the XB1, and this is the design as it existed uh, in mid 2016. Um, and uh, behind me, right here, is uh, a wind tunnel model that is much more recent and much closer to the finalized design of the XB1. And so you'll notice a bunch of things have changed. The vertical tail has gotten bigger, the wingspan has increased, the shape of the leading edge of the wing has changed, the nose design has evolved, uh, and those all reflect things we've learned about supersonic aerodynamics and also how to balance uh, a, a, an airplane for high-speed flight as well as low-speed takeoff and landing. Uh, originally, XB1 had three engines fed from two intakes, and we've gone to a uh, a three intake for three engine design that improves uh, stability of the propulsion system and basically reflects that we learned how to integrate the third intake uh, into the base of the tail without causing uh, issues with drag and performance. This is a 3D printed model of the propulsion system for our, our production airplane. Over here we have the jet engine itself and it's, it's basically an adapted version of a conventional subsonic jet engine and a fact a lot of people don't know about jet engines is they're all subsonic on the inside. So at the point the air hits the face of this fan, it needs to be going about half the speed of sound, Mach about 0.5. And of course, the, the oncoming airflow uh, is Mach 2.2. So all of this here is what's called the inlet, and it's all about slowing and compressing that Mach 2.2 air and very efficiently and uniformly feeding it to the engine. Now, designing this is one of the most complex pieces of the airplane. Uh, Concord had to solve the same problem of uh, basically taking in supersonic air and feeding it to the engine, and it was one of the hardest things on that airplane. Uh, what we're trying to do is create uh, really high precision parts that are also great up to high temperatures. Okay. So at, at Mach 2.2, the nose and the leading edges of the aircraft will be 307 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's toasty. And uh, even manufacturing those parts that have the high temperature capability uh, requires a sophisticated multi-step process. Right. So in fact, there are like two stages of molds. So there's basically a low precision mold right. and then a high precision mold. Um, and what we're seeing here is uh, the low precision mold that's made out of foam. Okay. Uh, then you may basically make a low precision polyurethane master off of that and use that master to then create a high precision mold. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, then that, and then within those molds, you lay up the carbon fiber parts. Those castings uh, that come out of the molds I was just showing you are, uh, end up with these big blocks of uh, blue polyurethane. So that's what we're looking at here. This comes out of the foam mold. And then to make the actual composite uh, tool, we lay off uh, multiple layers of carbon fiber pre-thread on top of the uh, on top of the batch. So that's what's going on here. Uh, it's about a dozen layers of carbon to uh, to create that that tool. So now we're going to see what the uh, completed molds look like. Okay. Uh, so all these parts over here are for XB1. Um, this is the very forward section of the nose. Uh, so the, this mold uh, mates together with this mold uh, to make the bottom half of the XB1 fuselage nose mold. Uh, and you can see some of the features of the aircraft if you look carefully at the mold. So this, this cutout here is the landing gear door. Uh, so that's half of it there. You can see the other half of the landing gear door cut out on the other side of the mold. So this is uh, 
So this big piece here is uh, the XP-1 wing spar. Uh, so this is what carries the weight of the airplane out into the wings to be held up. So it's uh, one of the most critical structural elements. And uh, so we built, we built this. Uh, the little wires you're seeing on it uh, connect to strain gauges. So we tested this up again to flight loads at over 300 degrees to see the uh, strength and uh, deformity parameters uh, of that, of that uh, design. You want to understand exactly how your materials are performing uh, so you have enough strength in the part, but you don't have any more material than you actually need to accomplish your mission. So today, the experience of flying commercial is incredibly stressful. You worry about missing your flight, you worry about how long the security line is going to be, you get hassled going through security, and you step on board the airplane and there's that annoying kind of high-pitched hum that just, uh, just makes you feel anxious. And so our, uh, our design experience goal for Boom is to exude tranquility and to make it a relaxing, low-stress experience from the moment you step on board. And to, to do that, you sweat the details. You make sure you don't have equipment on the airplane that makes funny sounds. You make sure that the, uh, the PA system has high-quality speakers and is uh, tuned to an appropriate volume so it's not too loud or too soft. Um, you cover up seams in the airplane. Uh, you know, ever, today, you step on board a, a Boeing or Airbus jet and uh, look at the number of gaps and seams and kind of visual clutter in the experience. It adds, uh, I think it adds to the stress of the experience and we sweat the details to get those out so that you can have a relaxing, low stress travel experience, at least from the moment you're on the airplane. Well, you get some disbelief that a startup can do this. Uh, you know, we got told in the early days that supersonic jets are the, can only be done by governments and militaries. Uh, you know, we get some folks saying, well, you don't have an engine for the production airplane yet. I think that's probably the most legitimate uh, uh, criticism. Uh, and we are working behind the scenes on that. We've got multiple good options. We just haven't announced it yet. I think we're at the start of a really exciting period of innovation. Uh, if you look at commercial aviation, for example, the last new company created that built commercial aircraft yeah. was founded 95 years ago, Douglas Aircraft, 1921. Right. And that's the last new company that actually built you know, large transport aircraft. And we see the same pattern in general aviation. There was a massive renaissance you know, in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, then a hiatus of serious activity. And with folks like Icon and Cirrus, you know, really quite recently, we've seen an uptick in activity. Uh, I think we've also, on the high end, seen some inspiration from SpaceX, right. what they've been able to do with rockets. And, uh, and now folks are turning back, folks like Boom are turning back and saying, well, hey, well, let's, let's do what for airplanes, what SpaceX has done for rockets, do some uh, forward-leaning capability that really changes what's possible, uh, but in ways that the big guys wouldn't do or can't do. Uh, we are staying very deliberately within a proven envelope of technology. So the, the materials, the flight controls, the engine technology has all been proven before in other aircraft. We know it's safe, reliable, and efficient, uh, but it's been used to make the machine a little bit more efficient. We're saying, hey, let's, let's take that same proven technology and use it to make the passenger's life more efficiently, to give you more of that thing you can't get any more of, which is time. Right. To, um, make the world a smaller place in a certain sense, but to make each individual's world bigger. 
uh, let you accomplish more in a day, more in your life, go more places, have relationships with people that you otherwise couldn't have.